you've been a, a great defender of um, arguing for the role of introspection, like that it should take a kind of more of a, have a more high profile role in, in our understanding of the mind is kind of being comparatively neglected in the West, right? It has been for the last 110 years, but one of my great heroes among the great pioneers of modern psychology, the scientific and experimental um, study of the mind was William James. And he, together with Wilhelm Wundt in Leipzig, and the English, the English psychologist Edward Tischner, who emigrated to America, took a, a very leading position at Cornell University. These were some of the great shining lights, the luminaries, for the first 30, 35 years of modern psychological study of the mind. And they all advocated a truly scientific approach to the mind. And William James actually wrote an article, a plea for psychology as a natural science. And if you look at all of the other natural sciences, biology, biology, cosmology, you name it, all of the other fields of natural science, going back to the time of Galileo, have had as the primary mode of inquiry, the direct, sophisticated, rigorous, and replicable observation, experimentation, investigation of the phenomena they seek to understand. So if you want to understand plants, you look at plants. If you want to understand the planets, you don't go to astrology, you don't go to astrological chart, you actually look at the planets. And that's what Galileo did and started the revolution in, in the natural sciences altogether. And so I'll take William James as the spokesman for that thir first 35 years or so of modern psychology. And he said, first, foremost, and always, we, rely, we should rely upon introspection to understand the mind, because this is the truly scientific approach. Observe carefully that which you wish to understand as in a, in a branch of science. Whereas if all you're willing to study because of the metaphysical constraints of materialism, ideological constraints, if it's not material, it doesn't matter, literally. And the only way to study something is by looking outwards to the objective, third person, and quantifiable. Um, that, in fact, from the time of James Watson, the founder, one of, at least one of the great founders of modern behaviorism, they basically kowtowed to the beliefs of materialism and threw off the empiricism of the natural sciences, all branches of natural science, up to that point. And he said, never mind introspection. In fact, we won't speak about subjective experience and introspection will have no role. So that was a collapse. That was the collapse of a truly empirical study of the mind. And they supplanted that by looking at the behavioral expressions of the mind, which is all very well, but it's not looking at the mind. And then from the 1960s and so, the birth of the modern academic discipline of neuroscience, then they studied the neural correlates of the mind. But the fact that two things are correlated, not by any stretch of any logic, does it mean that if two things are correlated, they must be the same thing. Or that one, one thing in a very straightforward and simplistic fashion causes the other, like a light switch. I'm looking at a light switch right now across the room. And I went over there as a scientist, say, wow, what, what is that little button there? And I push it and I see the light goes on. I push it again, the light goes off. Wow, there's a correlation. And it's a direct correlation, up, down, on, and off. Wow. So that, that therefore, light must be a function of, the, of the, uh, the light switch. Well, that's crazy. Or light actually must be located in the light, light switch. After all, they're correlated. But that's just crazy. And that's exactly the kind of craziness that's dominating the mind sciences for the last 110 years. If there's a correlation, the brain must be the sole cause of it. And all mental functions, dreams, emotions, desires, must be inside chemicals. And if there was ever a categorical error in the history of science, that's the zaniest, thinking that dreams exist inside synapses and neurons, chemicals, and so forth. It's a loony, a loony idea. But for the true believers, the true believers in materialism, they're compelled to believe that. Otherwise, they would have to acknowledge that there are non-physical things in the universe. And this is a fundamental article of faith. And it is faith and not science that the only things that exist are the physical matter, energy, and the emergent properties. And they will hold to that to their dying, dying breath. And so as Max Planck, the founder of, of, of modern quantum mechanics said, and I paraphrase it very closely, such people who are such true believers like religious fundamentalists, you can throw all the evidence at them and it won't have an impact. You can throw reasoning and logic at them and an impact and it will have no impact, just like religious fundamentalists. Um, and so Max Planck said, it doesn't help to try to defeat them with logic, you just have to wait for them to die. The science progresses funeral by funeral.
and this is not a death wish, it's just a fact, the old guard that have made their whole reputations and earned their, all their awards and accolades and so forth, all rooted in the unquestioned belief of materialism. They would have to sabotage their entire career and said, hey, mea culpa, I made a big mistake when I was 20. And they're not going to do that. And so they're just going to retire. And then we'll see people of your generation and even younger coming in and said, hey, we don't, we don't really care for those shackles that you put yourself on. And there's a lot more to reality than what fits into the human construct, the category of the physical. So get real. The universe is not anthropocentric. The whole universe doesn't feel, fit into a conceptual construct made by human beings in the 20th and 21st century. It's so parochial. It's, all, it's kind of a joke. But when a lot of people you know, believe in a joke, then it's taken seriously by a lot of people, the same ones. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, um, it's strange that the, the, the actual, when you, when you look into kind of, you know, what um, the kind of uh, worldview of science really is uh, versus what people in science say, there's a complete disconnect, you know, the, and I think for a lot of us, this who defend the synthesis of science and spirituality, this is what we, we point to is that, you know, you have the reality of conscious lived experience and that comes first really in, in our, you know, for us, like this is it. Like, and then if you're so inclined and you enjoy the game of mapping out the laws of nature, great, you can go and do that, but never forget that it's a map of, of the real thing is the lived conscious experience. And if you're going to get so infatuated with the map that you think only the map exists and you know, you thought you were in love with your partner, but actually you're not it because the map tells me it's all this meaningless, empty stuff. That's just, again, as you say, I mean, that's just kind of, um, it's a kind of mistaken thinking. Science actually doesn't say that science just says it's a map. You know, it doesn't say that, that love is just a chemical reaction in the brain. You know, that's the kind of story told by, by people who want, who maybe don't feel as comfortable talking about the kind of spiritual side of things. Um, 